Tim, thanks for coming back on the show. You're welcome. Good to see you. I wanted to look at your book today, the Shinyi Nagong book. Maybe you tell me, yeah, tell me your background with this text. So uh, briefly, uh, I was I was working with Dan Miller in the Bagua Journal. Probably must have been 1990-ish. And we were in Beijing and we interviewed um, uh, one of, um, he used to be the head of the um, Beijing Xingyi Chuan Association. So we went to see him, right? And uh, anyway, you know, we learned the Neigong and, you know, it's a very good set. And we took pictures of, you know, original pictures of it and things. And then I, I was probably six months later, I was traveling in China and I was in some place like, I can't remember where I was, Luoyang or somewhere. And I went into this like little bookstore and I saw a book on the shelf that said Xingyi Neigong. And I was like, yeah. And it actually was the author's son. So, you know, I called Dan and, and I said, you know, there's this, we didn't know this book existed. So we decided to, to like make like a compendium of the whole system. So we went back and Zhang Baoyang, the, the man I talked about, we interviewed that had trained with, you know, who, was, who, would, who had taught us to set. You know, we, we took pictures of him. I, I translated um, their stuff, uh, the other book, and then we put this book together. And then Dan wrote uh, the history part. And then I, I wrote, I wrote some, some parts. I wrote a couple chapters, you know, explaining the concepts. And then we put it all together, and that, that was Xingyi Nago. Oh, so you were, you were basically the impetus then? When I, yeah, when I found, you know, when I, when I found the other book, I, yeah, kind of like, you know, it was a really good set. We, we, were, we were very impressed by it. And then when we, when we found more information on it, we felt like we could actually do, do it justice kind of thing, you know, like, like have a kind of a complete idea about it and with the history and, and concepts. And then, the, you know, we took new pictures and the whole bit. Otherwise, you know, we didn't want to, you know, we didn't want to just to kind of make a cursory attempt at presenting the material. That book took quite a bit of time to finally complete, actually. So maybe we could even do a little bit more back out, back up on this a little bit. So like, um, why were you, how long had you been there? Why were you there? We, so I went with Dan, I went with Dan, I was in Taiwan at the time and I went with Dan to the main, I would, I'd gone on a, several trips with him to, to translate, you know, to work as an interpreter. And uh, that trip, yeah, we, we heard about Zhang Baoyang, and, and he was kind of retired then. He lived to be in his 90s. He was really, you know, really uh, fit, really good martial artist. And he was, Wang Ji was a student, the, the, author, the original author of the, of the book, the guy that put the set together. He was one of his top students. So we went to interview him. And we, we'd never heard of the Neigong at that point. And he was talking about, you know, the Xingyi system. And then he was like, you know, we have this set of exercises uh, for kind of health and power training. And we're like, oh, cool, you know, kind of thing. We didn't know. So then he started demonstrating and talking about the history of it and showed us pictures of Wang Ji Wu. And, we're, and I, we were like, hey, right away we were impressed. We we're like, hey, this is really, it was an interesting set. It was kind of a, a, a balance between a little bit of esoteric Qigong, Neigong kind of practices with, with kind of conditioning exercises. And it all had, some of them were specifically Xing Yi based and some seemed to be just conditioning. And he put, he put the set together. And uh, apparently he was, a, Wang Ji was a uh, Chinese doctor and they said he would prescribe these exercises like medicine. Like if he had a certain problem, he would prescribe you a certain exercise. But his whole life, they, he taught the set for free to anyone that wanted to learn it. Because his idea was, you know, if you learn this set and you do it every day, you'll be healthy. You know, you have a lot less chance of being sick or injured and all that, right? And uh, so that's, so Wang Ji was the, the uh, creator of the set. Um, they said he didn't create the exercises. He he knew a lot more than that. Like he accumulated all this kind of old Nagong training and he'd done Xing Yi his whole life and that kind of thing. And then he picked out uh, the exercises that, that he thought would make a balanced set for all around health. Plus if you want power training for martial arts and that, that would became the Nagong, the, the Xing Yi Nagong. So um it was great. So we, you know, learned the set from him. I guess in a week or so, we learned the exercises, and and, and uh, it was all good. And then when I found Wang Ji's son's book, you know, we felt like we had enough material to translate, and we didn't want to just, you know, take pictures of us doing it, and you know what I mean, like hey, hey. all this thing. And so then we went back, and Zhang Baiyan was super gracious. He posed for all the all the he did the exercise. He posed for all the pictures for us. Then I translated the the books, and then yeah, Dan wrote the history, like I said, and I wrote a chapter or two on concepts, and that's how we put it all together. And so Zhang Baiyang is his student, 
Wang Ji Wu's? Correct. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you knew him. Wang Ji Wu had passed away before we 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 met them. He had just he passed away. John Baiyang. Yeah, John Baiyang is the gentleman in the book in yeah. the back of the book doing the exercises, and he lived to be in his into his nineties. And Wang Ji Wu, the the guy that you know the 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 uh, creator of the set, lived to be in his early hundreds. So obviously didn't do any harm. You know what I mean? A pretty good set of stuff. And they had a nice idea too of balance between you know a lot of the people we met, and and it's common you know as athletes is everything super hardcore training all the time you know kind of thing and their idea was ah you got to play the long game which was nice so maybe because of Wang Ji Wu's uh, medical background as well right so he had a obviously a very very uh, clear idea that that martial arts training was good for you but it's not complete because it's not for health it's for martial arts right it's good exercise it's not complete and that there's got to be a balance between you know, kind of intense training and then what we now would call recovery and then what we would now call supplementary training to kind of fill in the, 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 the spaces left vacant by just training for martial arts. So, you know, I mean, you can imagine any martial art, you know, you're going to, you'll condition, but you're going to spend all your time training the moves you're going to use when you fight, you know, that kind of thing or drilling your technique. So, like you could be, say, for example, you could be a great boxer and have super tight hamstrings because you never, you know what I mean? You, that's not just something you do. So, or you could be a, a, you know, a really good wrestler and not have, you know, you'd be missing some other attribute, right? So that set was to balance, not only be uh, uh, power training for martial arts, for Shingi specifically, it was also to balance out all the, all the imbalances that you might get just training for a martial art. And then, a, a, you know, a great amount of attention placed on health building. So did this set have a have a have a name? Did he give it a name, or was this his, he just picked these postures out? Well, he put it together again. He chose the exercises. Wang Ji Wu chose these exercises to make the set, and we just called it Xing Yi Xing Yi Nei Gong. He called it. Yeah, uh, Nei Gong is uh, Nei is internal, right? Yeah, Gong is training. So Nei Gong is the like the like the term Qi Gong, for example, is new. You know that was invented in the yeah, probably the fifties. It was, it was, it was kind of a new name. They didn't, they didn't, the, the government at the time, you know, didn't like old things in China. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a new name, although they recognized the value of all these exercises that were older and they didn't want any mystery in it. Or, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of kind of baggage maybe and, and mysterious ideas. And so they, they coined the term Qigong, which is breathing exercises. Right. Mm -hmm. But, but prior to that, the oldest, the oldest terms for these kinds of trainings would be Daoing. Mm -hmm. Um, those would be the most ancient names, and then it kind of, you know, had uh, different labels. And Nei Gong was usually associated with martial arts, though. Like you're 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 practicing like an internal power. And then, of course, people are going to interpret what you mean by Nei Gong differently. Um, nowadays, in general, I feel like people would say Qi Gong is maybe a branch of Nei Gong as as, as an umbrella term. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's not only breathing exercises. So Nei Gong, and Nei Gong's uh, interesting. I've had people ask me over the years, they go, Tim, you're just moving your arms. Where's the, they, they expect some kind of weird, you know, I don't know, meditative. It's not, Nei Gong's not like that. The Nei Gong part, the, the, the key to Nei Gong is your intent. It's using the intent to make the movements or to make the shape, like Xing Yu Tran, right? To make the shape of your movements. And it's how you use your intent to create the shape of your form. And mm -hmm. your movement, that's important. And the breathing is actually secondary to it. If you practice breathing exercises, like Qigong is the same thing in, in Indian as, as in yoga, saying pranayama, you know what I mean? Prana and qi, you, you, pranayama and Qigong are basically the same terms. And it's more about, you know, you're breathing, you're practicing different breathing patterns, and they cause different effects and different you know, effects on your, your, your brain waves. And that kind of, all we know that all that's great. Nei Gong is, is more about, the, the breathing is important, but it's more about the intent. Mm -hmm. So there's levels to the Xing Yi Nei Gong. And in the book, in the book, um, you know, the movements are fundamentally the same. Mm -hmm. It's not, not like a lot of Western exercise where the levels might be, you know, a beginner does push-ups on their knees and then they progress to regular push-ups, then incline push-ups and has that put. The movements are fundamentally the same. It's the level of intent and the control of like your actual, you know, body, your muscles that, 
that progressively get deeper. So yeah. you might watch someone do, and you might say, wow, that guy looks like he's smoother or something, right? But, you know, he's doing fundamentally the same movements. So the Neigong I did, at a basic level, they're calisthenics. They literally are calisthenics. You just line up and you just kind of do, you know, exercise, right? Mm-hmm. And you might match your breathing. And then once you have the choreography down and you become strong enough physically for that, then you start to go into deeper levels of uh, intent and and control. And there's certain images you use and that kind of thing. So it's nice because it's 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 a variable system. So you could teach someone that say someone's super out of shape, don't care at all about Xing Yi or fighting or you know, they don't have but you say, okay, so you know, you talk about good alignment, breathing, right amount of tension, relaxation, you have them do calisthenics. You're exercising. And then at a deeper level, if they say, well, I want to start developing like actual what we would call power, like internal power for the martial arts, then you'd go into the next level of intent. Thank you. So there's a interesting thing here because a lot of people are like, well, you got your external and internal arts, and the internal arts is just slow. If you move slow, then it's an internal art. But that's not what we're saying here. No. It's about it's our intention. Night and night. So the book is way too big to do in one go. So I, I thought we would just focus on some fundamentals here. Okay. Um, so these basic concepts. So the first one we start with is relaxation. Um, and so you're talking intent, and I thought this was interesting that they're connecting song and the yi. So the intent, so the jing and the song. Right. So they go together. Uh, so, you know, relaxation is always a hard word when, you know, that's why people that teach Tai Chi, you know, they, they launch into hours long explanations of what it really means, right? It's, it's because it literally means relax in Chinese, like a common Chinese feng song, it's like relax, buddy, you know, that kind of thing. But in the internal martial arts or in martial arts in general, you know how like, like a layman would use a word, but if you're in physics, it would mean something different. You know what I mean? Like if you say, uh, I have a theory in common talk, common speech. That means, well, I have like what, what in science you'd say was a hypothesis. Like I have this idea in, in science, a theory is, is a, is a fact. Basically it's been proven again and again and again, you know what I mean? So with martial arts are the same way. When you use the word like song in Carmen parlance or something, it means I'll relax. But when you use it in martial arts, it has a way more complicated meaning. Right? So I feel like the, the best way to, to understand song is the absence of excess tension not no tension. You have to use tension. You just have, if you didn't use any tension at all, you'd never get off the ground. You just have to lay still, right? So song is very difficult to do in general at first, right? It takes a lot of practice. So it's relaxation, the correct amount of relaxation and, and tension in every single part of your body all the time. What, so you start off usually standing because it reduces the variables to a minimum. It's not complicated. So you stand there and find it. Then you start to move very, very carefully to keep it. Then you move faster. And then you have you know, more and more complicated movement tasks. And then you have someone hit you while you're doing it. And you start you know, doing martial arts. So song is interesting. So you know, most people are over tense, especially if they're doing something active. So you, you, know, you kind of have them relax, right? It'd be, it'd be like it, when, you, when you teach yoga, if you tell someone like, you know, relax, and then you have them do a handstand, they'd be like, bro, I can't relax and do a handstand. So it's the correct amount of relaxation for the task at hand. So if you have correct skeletal alignment, you have a correct relationship with gravity, oops, sorry, a correct, a correct relationship with gravity, then you're, you're using your force in the most efficient manner. That's some, what I mean? So that's how, that's what it starts with. So first, first you really, and, and Song's multi-layered. So w- without correct skeletal alignment, you can never have correct muscular relaxation. You can't. So, you know, if you're out of line, your skeleton's misaligned in gravity, you're always going to have some muscles that are over tense to hold you in place and other muscles that are not working at all. So you first find like the zero point of your alignment, right? That's got to be first. And again, that's why you usually start standing still. And from there, that zero point, you can, you know, you can release any excess tension that you have. So you have the right amount of relaxation with some tension. I mean, you've got to have the correct amount of tones to, to hold the position. And then when you start moving, your intent will generate whatever amount of effort is appropriate for you at the time. So if you're a beginner, it's not much. You're just trying to kind of move your joints, stay balanced, you know, not overdo things. And as you get to higher levels, the intent will generate more tension, more effort correctly, and you get stronger. So I feel it's very important for uh, 
people that do internal, a lot of times they have this idea that it's almost like they want to be weaker. This is a horrible idea. This is a horrible idea for in general. Like they feel like they need to be relaxed to the point that kind of there's no energy at all. And somehow if they do that long enough, they'll magically be strong or have, it'll never happen. So you cannot make a muscle stronger without tension. It's impossible. You know what I mean? It's impossible. You, you lift a, you know, you lift a three pound barbell, you do 5,000 bicep curls. You're not going to get any strong. You have to have. So there's a, there's a certain amount of tension that can be generated, but it's always controlled by your intent. So that's relaxation. It's a complicated idea at first. So at a baseline, you're releasing any excess tension that you don't need that that's happening unconsciously. That will be the first. That's song. And and then he's he's saying then the second part of this idea of relaxation has to do with the mind. That the well, intent, that, really, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it's always it's you know you know like meditative practices. You, you practice yoga. You practice internal other every a lot of things, right? You know, they give you an image. You know, you're your head suspended from the ceiling, like you're hanging and then you would go through your whole body and relax muscles or imagine different. So even at the basic level, that's why it's difficult to do, right? Most of us will hold tension and it's subconscious. So if it's subconscious, you don't really know you're doing it. So you need to get some kind of practice where you're, you're, you're given instructions about alignment and, and feeling different muscles, even at the basic level. And then it becomes higher and higher levels of conscious control. I feel like it's the concept of song is 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 difficult from the get go, you know. So it's, it's a it's a it's a fairly complex uh, concept. But if you knew that though going in, you know, so if a teacher tells you it's not overly relaxed, it's not overly tense, and kind of says so, you're only going to find this through cultivating the practice day in and day out. You're going to come into an embodied awareness of what this is, and it's going to continue to develop for you. Then you have a much better shot at it than just saying, "Oh, you need to relax." Well, that's exactly well. That's why you need to be a teacher, right, or someone who knows. <laughs> so I usually talk about, and I say this in every seminar I do, and you know, I say it, in, even if they, everyone's trained with me before, you know, over and over, it's so important. Think tension and relaxation, or if you think of it that way, are on a on a on a continuum. Mm-hmm. There's a spectrum. So at one end of the spectrum would be what what the Chinese would call Jing. Like everyone likes to say Fa Jing, right? Jing. Jing is train strength. The Jing is what? Train strength. It's strength. Train. It's it's a you you you've understand you understand how to generate force maximally for whatever that movement is, right? So and it's not only a martial arts term. I, I try to explain this. If you see a, a Ch- like the Chinese see a weightlifter, you know, like do a complicated lift, that he'd be like, oh it's jing, like he has a lot of jing. Or or you know, a good swimmer has swimming gene. It's super efficient, right? A baseball batter has batter gene. And then the better they are at it, so whatever whatever inherent strength and force they have, they can use it maximally train to train it's train strength, train force. That's gene. On the other end of the spectrum would be what the Chinese call Zhuo Li, which is like Zhuo actually means clumsy, or or they'll, they'll say uh, brute force, right? So it's clumsy force. You're on coordinated force. And that's at the end of the end of the spectrum. But everybody's using force. You know what I mean? So if you throw a guy that can't or can barely swim in a pool, he will thrash around and use a ton of force, but he'll barely move forward. And then I always say, you know, you imagine an Olympic swimmer. They look like a, a dolphin, right? They look like they're moving almost in slow motion, but they're flying like a torpedo. So they're both swimming. right? So what's the difference? Well, the trained swimmer has jing. I mean, he's got technique. He's, he's got strength, specific strength for the task at hand. He has technique, right, and coordination, right? He coordinates his body. So that's what we're, everyone's working towards. It's not an internal, external magic idea. You know, any kind of – it's everyone's working towards that. So that's a continuum of, of uh, like, clumsy brute force to jing, right? And then relaxation's on a continuum, intention on a continuum as well. It's not bad to be tense as long as it's consciously controlled and – we'll just say, quote unquote, correct for the task at hand, right? So obviously if, if the task is, you know, moving something light, you won't use as much tension as moving something heavy. So if you have to, you know, you were talking about building a stone wall, you got to pick up a 80 pound rock. Are you going to do a com- completely relaxed? No, of course not. 
but you're going to do if you do it with correct alignment and efficiency that's correct it's a correct you, you did the right thing right so you can think as well like people who did internal back in the day they're internal they're soft whatever and then they swing around gigantic weapons that's lifting weights but it, they're doing it i mean they preferred a weapon even if it wasn't for fighting it's because of the movement patterns you know what helped them with with their whole art but they're heavy why were they heavy because it made them stronger you're learning how to use your force correctly with something heavier right so all these things are fine lifting weights is fine everything's fine as long as you're doing it i mean what we would say would be correctly right so, uh the intent so so imagine imagine something like like hungar like a what we would most people call an external style and there's a lot of dynamic tension involved like i did it when i was a kid right you're not supposed to just randomly tense your muscles like you know like you're constipated or something you're supposed to put in certain amount of force at certain times right through your whole body this this requires far more control of your muscles than just kind of moving around in a relaxed manner much much more mental control so their idea would be we'll we'll explore how much tension we can generate that and we can still control and then we'll back off you know they're they're, they're creating greater and greater, greater and greater levels of conscious control over their muscles and let's face it you can see anything you want the only thing that's making you move around are your muscles so when people say mind body unity or my mind and body are connected they're saying my mind's connected to my muscles it's not connected to their internal organs you can't feel them you know what i mean i mean you might you might relax and it's good you know you know so in martial arts you're talking about your control of your muscles primarily mind body unity is your control over your your organs of movement there's this sense that, um, so back to the rock. So I was talking to an Alexander teacher a while ago and he was saying, you know, the idea is you pick up this rock or a cup or something and you take it across the room or you put it to where you go. It's like you can pick the object up and then be focused on the task versus pick up the object and stay with the object and still achieve the task where that requires a certain kind of mental discipline of staying present in the body. And then there's this sense of, you know, I can be in my body piecemeal, jumping around, or I can have this, re and it takes practice, like, to really, can I be consciously aware of the entire body simultaneously, even muscles, like the foot and the hand at the same time, or am I just jumping around foot to hand, foot to hand? Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Going back to your Alexander point, so Alexander called picking up a stone and then just looking at the goal and gaining, and yeah. that was a big, a big problem that people have so end gaining is you're not really paying attention to the moment you just you're, you're focused on the result only and then you're not really sure how you got there right or were you efficient as efficient as possible or not right and, and putting your mind in your whole body is your kinesthetic sense he called it the crown of your senses right alexander alexander yeah. dialed in right <laughs> alexander called you know the the kinesthetic sense the crown of your senses because it was the sense that allowed you to feel your whole body right and you're absolutely right so a lot of training and in, in what again, and what we would call infernal styles, or when I practice yoga, those kind of things is is a uh, is uh, kind of a whole body awareness. When I first started practicing Taiji, my teachers, at first, it's very difficult to do these kind of things. So you know, it was more about you know imagining resistance in your upper body. Oh, you kind of line up, and then eventually, you know, they were like, you can move from your center and kind of keep track of your whole body at once, right? That kind of idea. Mm -hmm. So you that's that would be kind of one of the one of the goals so yeah being not end gaining being present with the task is is uh super important and very very difficult yeah and so what's, what's the equivalent here what would be the word in the in the text under these basic concepts that of his idea of end gaining oh no so the being present is the again it's the mind body unity idea the use of the intent yeah so you know, yeah, exactly. You pick something up, you forget you're holding it, and then that's when accidents happen, right? And you're running to put it on the fence, and then you fall down and hurt yourself. So you were gaining, and you weren't present. Your mind-body unity was separated; it was on something else. So that that would be that's why I, the ne gong always goes back to intent, it goes back to your intent. So, for example, one of the supplementary exercises in the the Xing Yi ne gong is uh, Hindu push-ups, basically scooping push-ups, right? Ten, they say in Chinese, they're difficult to do correctly. They're very, they're very difficult. I have a lot of athletes that are, you know, strong young men, and when you show them how to do those correctly, they can't do ten. They could do eighty push-ups, so they're very difficult. 
Are you gonna, you know, are you gonna do those completely? Real? No, you're gonna have to use the appropriate amount of force, and you got to pay attention at all times to keep those alignments right. So they're difficult. So, you know, again, it's a good example of of Nagong at different levels. It's it's literally one of the they're one of the top Nagong exercises. So if you you got to be present at all times, you're, you're, something will go wrong or you'll fall. You'll not be able to complete those movements beyond a couple of reps. I like how in there in the text they're talking about the intent. Like it it can't be too relaxed, but it can't be too excited. You're also trying to find, you know, with the song and the mind, you're trying to find this middle space of tension, relaxed tension, and and achieve the task through that. And they're also talking a lot. I was surprised about the visualizations Correct. that they're using. They at one hand point they're talking about a hose and water coming out your fingers. Like yeah, I put I put that in those in that. Yeah, that that's the chapter I wrote because what we found when when we when when we done the interviews and translated the books uh, and, and not not that, no again I'm I want to you know make make sure everyone knows I, I'm not I wasn't trying to interject my own uh, kind of like teachings or improve on it at all. What we were trying to do was just make it a like uh, add some explanation of what we learned from them. So. Uh, cause some of it was still a, you know, a little bit esoteric and did, but some of it's hard to translate as, so, you know, that's why actually Dan asked me to write those, like that chapter on the concepts. Um, because I, you know, I, I'm a fluent English speaker as well. Right. So when I translate, then I can maybe, I could, it's like, I try, I, and I was true to what they said though. I want people to, you know, I don't want to think that we were trying to interject anything of our, our own, just trying to clear it up. And that was just now anal a common analogy that I'd learned, right? They used the same idea in Aikido. They did it when I learned, you know, in my internal I was talking about energy out and all that kind of thing. So we just felt that some of those um, images might be easier to accept, access first. So the thing is, uh, so, so here's a question. If I say to you, I want you to do these movements and use your intent. You'd be like, great. What does that mean? What does that mean? Right? So you can say, I want to, I'm going to focus on this, but focus on what, you know, your biceps or your crown of your head or, or, you know, I don't know. So that's it. When you say use your intent, it's a tricky word. And a lot of people throw the word out because they've heard the word and it sounds cool, but there's not really much explanation behind it. So one way you can use your intent is by imagining things. And it's the primary way you use your intent in the internal, my experience. So you can think about any, almost any, any, you know, uh, teacher of the internal martial arts or, or Nagong that you've ever heard of. And, and most, you'll always have images, you know, like if you think about the softest Tai Chi you can think of, like Jung Man Shing style, he says you're, it's like you're uh, swimming on dry land, you imagine you're in water, you know what I mean? So what does that do? Everybody's been in water, right? Everybody's been in a pool or taken a bath and you can imagine, oh, okay, there's like a, my whole body has this kind of resistance around it when I move. That's a way to, to create a kind of a whole body uh, awareness. So your kinesthetic sense feels your whole body, right? And just even though, you know, that style, for example, is famous for being soft, it's still providing resistance in your intent, right? You imagine water, there's resistance. Or my Bagua teacher would say like you're, like you're walking through oil, like something very thick. Or in, in Bagua Jiang, they'll talk about when you walk the circle, you have a rope around your waist and you're dragging a boulder. What does it do? Uh, you have to align your hips back and then pull with your feet instead of push. So these, if I, I could give you a thousand details that you can't follow all at once, or I can give you one image. You know what I mean, if I said, okay, you know, uh, retract your hips, keep your feet in a certain position, pull with your heel, chest up, you'd be like, wow. If I said, ima imagine there's a boulder, a rope around your waist, you're dragging something heavy. I don't tell anyone anything and their hips go back and then they sit their weight down because they can imagine it, right? Now they're doing it correctly. So that's what images do. Images uh, allow you to align a whole bunch of technical and physical details at one time, fairly simply. Around a felt experience that you can recall. Right. You have to have something, right. So the, remember, the images too are tools. Sometimes people are like, they think they're special or they're, they're not. They're, they're, you can make them up, whatever, as long as they're, you know, they're achieving the task at hand. You know what I mean? So over, over gener, you know, probably millennia of people doing these things, you know, you come up with common images that most people get. And most people get. Now, if you're like, bro, I've never been in a bath before. I've never been swimming. That would be a good image, right? So 
you know, you come up with these shared kind of experiences people have, but you have to pay attention at every second or the image is gone, that feeling. So you've got to imagine it's very difficult, right? So even though it's probably the most expeditious way to teach it, it's a, it's a very, very uh, involved practice, even, even simple images, even standing. And you say, imagine you're squeezing a ball. The second you don't pay attention, which is going to be a lot at first, it's gone. And then you just, now you're just standing there, you know, you'll lose images will cause you to have physical reactions without you thinking about the specific reaction. Right. So if I said, like, say you're standing and you're doing John Zhuang and I said to you, okay, hold your arms like this, right. You go, okay. And you just, you're, and you'll get stronger. Your shoulders are contracted or whatever. And then if I came over and like started to slowly push your arms in and I said, no, no, no let me do it. Don't let me do it. Right. And I give you maybe 30% force and I do that for a minute. And then I said, look, I'm going to take my hands off. You need to keep that level of resistance, right? You could do it even after me pushing for a minute, but a beginner could do it for 10 seconds and then it'd be back to uh, just standing here. Someone who's advanced could do that for 30 minutes and there would be no gap in that intent. When you're fighting, the, the per people, or you compete in combat sports, you know, when, I mean, when people are actually hitting you or trying to submit you or whatever they're doing, if you go into denial, or you lose your train of thought, uh, or you're not paying attention, let's say, for one second, you'll, you may lose the fight in that second. So these ideas are, are great for your, you know, just kind of mental training and all that. But originally, the martial arts ideas, right? I could, I could relax by laying on the ground looking at the clouds. It's not going to make me a better fighter. So these things are, 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 uh, very, very sophisticated and, and high level, even if it's a simple image. And mostly it's about that mind-body connection and keeping it. It's not easy to do. Like, you, you know, and it's very, very hard to do. So you know, in English, we would say we're not just going through the motions, right? We have this intent behind it. The difference here, though, with the image, what I was thinking is like you have an internal image versus an external image. Like even swimming in water is an external, you're, you're relating to an external thing where like this would what you were suggesting in the text, so I don't know if you were borrowing on stuff they were doing, but you certainly find this in traditional Hatha yoga, real, real hot, true Hatha yoga, and then like definitely in Tibetan Buddhism, where the, the internal is visualized, where we're reimagining our body in different, more fluid ways and relating to it different because, you know, and I always think this too, like these original teachers where this, like you said, Dayin is the original stuff, you're out in nature. This, this, you're not looking at an anatomy book to learn your anatomy. All the calf inserts here and originates here. They have a much different understanding of anatomy, especially a lot of them are coming from a more organic, like embryology, where it's like there's not these little bits. They weren't, they didn't know, uh, learn anatomy from cadaver on a table and taking muscles out and being like, look at this one muscle is like this independent thing, where we kind of get a very mechanical industrial revolution view of the body now versus when these arts were designed, what was in those people's mind of what the body actually was and how it functioned? Does that make sense? And I feel like the visualizations tell us something about that. I could be wrong. No, no. So the, you, there's a, there's a, m maybe you know two primary ways you can do it. So like, say the shooting your water out of your fingers image, right? That would be more internal. I'm thinking about me. Yeah. Right? And you can think about this external resistance. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're, I understand they're, they are different. Right. And you're going to have to use both to a certain extent. But I feel that, you know, if it's a martial training, mm -hmm. what, what's an actual fight? Someone putting maximum force on you and you're going to meet resistance. I feel like this is why something like if you're doing something like a yoga practice or, 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 an, or a Nagong thing, when it's just for kind of health, let's call it, or, or you know, self, self-cultivation, sure. you might have less of that. No. Less of that kind of it. And, and it's great, right? And you can become stable like that, or you can, you know, you can control your body like that. But it's probably not going to transfer over a whole to uh, beyond a certain point of, you know, I'm lined up when it comes to actual fighting. Yeah. So uh, an internally focused visual, and they have them in internal, you know, people all the time are like, you know, put your intent in your Dantian, those kind of things. Those are internal, right? Yeah, I, I sort of feel like there's this internal alignment. Correct. It's there, like, even with the channels, if you want to visualize that, but it's a full body thing. It's not segmented. Like we tend to segment the body up. Like 
is my hips in line with the shoulders and the head where if like if you can wrap your mind around the entire structure simultaneously that seems more like what we're after yeah i, I absolutely agree but you're not going to do that at first you're going to start with part yeah, yeah 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 so it's the same thing it's like first line up the skeleton even you're going to have to have mechanical uh cues and it's a mechanical action and you can use images you know like when you say imagine your head's pulled up by a string those things you read right that's an image but you go oh okay a balloon's pulling my head up or you say you know like i am i'll say something imagine little weights on your scapula pulling down so it causes physical reaction but you got to do it part part by part and once your structure's okay you know then it it would go into deeper levels of it and event like i said eventually your idea is you have your kinesthetic sense is kind of global you know, some of the images are going to be internally driven and some are going to be, I imagine, for martial arts, you're going to have to have those. I'm moving against resistance because what that does is it lines your body up behind your whole body up behind your line of force. You know what I mean? So if I said, imagine you're going to stab with a spear, your hands have, I mean, anybody who's, you know, anyone stops, but can imagine pushing with a pole or something, right? Your hands will coordinate and you can focus your force into one line or whatever the, the task is. And those are going to require some idea of I'm going to use this against something else. So some are in, I mean, you know, how you ever want, you want to, terminology you want to use. Some of the images are going to be more internally. I, I'm, I'm feeling my whole body or I'm thinking about my Dantian or I'm imagining, like we talk about imagining you're expanding. These are the basic things. And later on comes, you imagine external resistances and those kind of things. So, you know, they're, they're both together. And you're right, absolutely. Like when you're fighting, you're not thinking about, well, I got my chi and my dante and I need to relax and bring my, it has to be done already, right? It has to be already your 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 state. And now your technique can come out, like what are, your trained reactions can come out. And then that's the process. I just didn't know if there was like, like in Tibetan Buddhism, we have very specific sets of visualizations that you progress through the student would progress through on a path i just didn't know if there was specific ones in this tradition i think the i think that the visualizations used um will vary by who teaches them but the actual sequence will be the same it's got to start off with fundamental alignment things and then uh whole body trying to feel your whole body things usually standing still and then for martial arts it would be simple movement things and when the movements come into play now we now we have an idea of external. Well, you might have already, but you have more of an idea of you're moving against something or through something most efficiently. And then, you know, it goes up and up and up. Yeah, exactly. It's the same. Now, you know, some teacher might say, you know, if you're in the Qing dynasty, they might say someone's pulling your cue up in the air. That, you know, you can have a different image as long as it writes your head and you're not lax and you're not tight. So I use my, you know, use the helium balloon tied to the crown of your head. It's floating up. You know, you get, the images are important because if you said, Imagine someone put a, you know, a gigantic boulder on your head. You're way more like, you might, you might line up, you're way more likely to be over tensing your, you know, your neck. So these things are what teachers have figured out over a long time. So again, for most people that they get, you know, you go, you're, you're a marionette, you're hanging by a string. People go, oh, you know, they kind of relax and do it. And that's, and the teacher needs to watch the student to see, you know, I have to bring them back. Like they're too tense. You bring them back. They're too lax. You, you, you'll, you'll power them up. Like you said, it's got to be kind of in the middle, you know, middle between two lakhs and two ten, and then that's the teacher's job. So the thing, that's it. Yeah, so it's more. This is embodied knowledge that's being passed. It's a teacher who gets it and can see the student and direct them individually. Um, you keep talking about the head being pulled up. Um, I feel like the, there's another image of of like an internal pressure pushing up and out, rather than being pulled. Sure. When you apply that, because this three-dimensional pressure, it seems like you have more, like, rather than hanging. Which, that, so, you know, all good. The thing is, though, day one, wow. I'm asking your head's being pulled up. Day one. Crazy. And <laughs> like we said, eventually you have this idea of internal expansion in all directions, right? Yes, yes, yes. So, you know, Chinese are like, you know, you have forward, back, side to side, up, down. But if you said to the guy, the guy that comes to his first yoga class, hey, bro, like expand, you know, and I, I will in the first lesson eventually. I'm like, I use my astronaut. I always, I always, you know, I always tell people I'm going to use images that are common except one. And then I, by a show of hands, you know, how many people have been in outer space? And so far, nobody in my, in my, you know, my, my seminars, right? But then I said, you know, we've all seen the movies. You imagine there's no gravity. All your cells would expand, all of your cells, your organs, your bones, your nerves, your muscles, right? There would be no pressure. And they're like little bags of water that would all expand from the inside out. 
and they get people go oh yeah you know you kind of feel like you're getting bigger so those things are okay but that's after you have the correct skeletal alignment because you could have horrible posture and still imagine that so first you know we have the crown up you know what i mean until their skeletons lined up now they have a chance at that zero point of everything being balanced and then i might go to my my astronaut and that will take some practice right and that's internally, that's an internally driven image so the images can be anything that work that's interesting too because the more you practice you have to become aware or you should become aware of gravity like there's internal pressures and external pressures whether you imagine them or not we're always interrelating with these pressures and our habits like keep you know we can stand up in it and not be aware of it and develop these bad postures to just keep us a, a, on our feet for a while and then they become laborious or in fact in a workshop i was with you you were saying there's always the opportunity to exercise against the gravity you always have this weight on you and if you're standing correctly then you're always getting the exercise just standing yeah it's it's correctly right so right i talk a lot I wrote about it a lot, a fair amount. I talk a lot about gravity. So, you know, gravity is the, it's like fish don't know they're in water kind of thing. You know, you just used to it until you get pulled out of it. So it's, 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 you know, what, what we don't, we don't really, I mean, obviously we understand, you know, everything has mass and weight or, but, but we don't, we're not, we are not cognizant of it at all times. And so you're absolutely right. Humans are super adaptable. So you could have, you know, like those those like fake ears in India that hold their arm up until it won't come down anymore. You know, and they feel probably feels perfectly natural at a certain point. You know how we adapt, right? So this is also, I mean, it's a survival mechanism, and it's also a big problem. So you can have horrible posture, and you get your some muscles will be overcompensate. You won't notice them anymore. Other muscles will be lax. They'll be weak. You won't notice. And you're stuck there and you feel just fine. So a lot of people, you know, because we're always sitting down at the computer and we're bent over, you know, people are kind of hunched down. When you straighten them up, they swear to God they're arched backwards. Their kinesthetic sense is off. And you have to to look at them. You know, now I take a picture with my phone. I go, no, no, look, this is, and they're like, oh, their their kinesthetic sense now is skewed from uh, adapting to these maladaptive alignments, right? And it takes time to to bring that back into kind of a uh, correct sense. So, yeah, you, you you need to you need to gravity's the gravity's the coach, right? You need you need to be like okay, and then, and again, you can imagine resistance. Like a lot of people, they're standing, and I said, look, if they're slumping, and I said, listen, reach your hands up. And I go, I'm going to lower a thousand pound barbell down, and they all go like this automatically. They, 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 their body feels like shit. I get crushed to death. You know what I mean? So these were images come in. So if you've ever held a heavy weight and you know, everybody's probably squatted a weight at one time or another, right? Or you can imagine carrying something heavy. So you just have to keep reminding yourself of it until your, your body adapts again. And that's the, all that, the whole idea of skeletal alignment, alignment for what purpose? When you're just standing there with no, no real resistance. There's always resistance here in the gravitational field. So it's either your, I, I wrote about it a long time ago. It's either your ally or it's your enemy. There's no middle ground. You can't, well, I'll just ignore gravity. We'll just call it a day. It doesn't, it doesn't work unless you're an astronaut in outer space, right? So it's either tearing you down or it's building you up. And you were, we, were, we evolved into it should be building us up. It should be making you stronger. These basic concepts again and again and again continue to refer back to the mind and visualization and so you're saying we all know about gravity of course we all conceptually understand there's gravity and it's holding things down but to come into relationship and begin to feel that gravity and it's and it's really in your body's relationship to it that's that's subtle and that takes time to develop that sense and so when they say things like the natural state of the body or correct alignment it's like i feel like we can have an idea of it going in but until we're actually develop a kinesthetic awareness of it in the relationship to gravity, that's when we're going to really learn our body's natural state. Correct. Yeah. Without, without an awareness. Well, you know, I mean, you could talk about if you're like an animal or something that never gets a bad habit, you know, I mean, you could, I suppose you could be a natural living guy in the forest, like a yeah. you know, caveman or something. But for us, what the, I mean, nothing that we, we don't sit in anything that's natural. We don't, you know, driving a car is not a lot of the things we do. And yeah. we do, you know, a lot of us in the modern world, we don't have enough physical activity to keep us lined up. 
Like, mm-hmm. for example, if you had to, if you had to walk quietly so you don't get eaten by another animal, right? Yeah. Yes. And you had to climb a tree to get get some fruit. Then you had to swim somewhere, and then you sat on the ground. Fine, you don't need nagon, or you know what I mean. You mean, you, but right, but but in general, these things most people they're going to find beneficial, and and, and until you understand uh, kind of the why of it, grab so exactly what what is correct alignment. Well. It's it's the most efficient alignment of your structure first and foremost for whatever the, your your task is, and then the next level up would be how you generate force and keep that alignment the most efficiently and all those things right. And understanding gravity and this is pretty much all of the images that I start with are about just alignment and gravity. Head floats up, you know. You imagine your scalp you're heavy or there's weights on your shoulder or whatever the image is. That's just to get you to feel like that actual constant weight on you. So, you know, there's movements, you know, where where weighted vests, rucksacks, you know, carry weights, all this stuff. But there's this there's this idea that the demand or the load will create the right structure over time. But I think there's more of a sensitivity here where you're actually paying attention. You're not just doing reps and sets to get in the hopes of getting stronger. When you put your mind in the body, you, you keep that kinesthetic awareness, like you said, with the arms on the tree, but don't break it. There's a learning that's happening in the individual. Right. Where, where then you can become conscious of the gravity. And so then it doesn't matter if you're sitting in a chair, you're walking, running, lifting, fighting. That kinesthetic sense is never going to leave you. So you're always, like you said, kind of exercising or getting stronger in the gravitational field and everything just becomes a, a new kind of challenge. Right. So, you know, that's, I, I think we talked, we have talked about this before or last time, but you know, when I was a kid, I, I read, I read books and they say, you know, real Kung Fu masters practice every waking minute. And yeah. I was like, where do they have time to eat? You know, I, I just picture them doing forms and Hiding and punching. Yeah, jumping around all the time. Like everything's yeah, yeah, yeah. doing forms. And you know, what they're talking about was what you just said. They're practicing all the time because they've developed this awareness of their, of their relationship with gravity, whatever they're, wherever they are. So they're moving kind of consciously all the time right not not like not anally like but they have just it's kind of like maybe it's a it's a low-key kind of you know that attention to the kinesthetic sense and it's become a habit but but they're not end gaining so every time they're moving around right they're kind of in this state of and and sometimes i say this people think that they're like super careful and it's like no 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 they're just doing natural things but because they've trained there's always a kind of self-awareness that's on the you know low key underneath everything they do right and and then they're always getting stronger and that's practicing all day long so there's a famous story of i think yang luchan you know the young taiji founder like fishing by the river and or maybe it was his grandson some one of the youngs was fishing by the river and this guy snuck up on him it's like oh, i'm gonna push him in the river and that'll embarrass him and i'll be famous and and he pushed him and, you know, he, he repelled himself off and landed on the ground. And Yang Wu looked over his shoulder and was like, oh, you know, and like, it's like a magic story, but it's apocryphal. But the idea is even when he was standing there fishing, he was lined up. You know what I mean? He was, he was, he's always kind of staying in his, he's never just like, oh, I'm not doing Tai Chi now. Just slumped over and doesn't care anymore. So those are, those are those stories they teach. And that would be kind of the goal, right? You're self-aware. That's the goal of all, all, almost all kind of these practices, isn't it? You know what I mean? Being self-aware. So, yeah, that's a big part of it. And, you know, people don't realize every everybody, every no, maybe not 24 hours a day, but every martial art you ever learn, it's 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 the one of the fundamental key uh, tenets of all the training is is not not end gaining. Right. Being focused at the time and doing it because you get, you know, otherwise you're going to lose. You see it a lot. In actual fights like two guys are arguing about something one guy just keeps chirping away the other guy you can see his face he's had an adrenaline dump 100 percent, he's going to hit that guy and that guy's like blah 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 and then he gets ko'd or he gets sucker punched and everybody in the audience that's never been in a fight is like dude like how did you not know that because he's in his own head he's 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 not he's not aware of his environment he's he's not there's no unity there there's no real awareness he's not even self-aware and then he's like, I didn't see that coming. You know what I mean? So if that guy would have, if that guy had done yoga and just been self-aware, he would have backed up before that guy punched him, right? Without doing any martial arts training. So what's more important, a million techniques or so that kind of self-awareness and the awareness of your environment, which, you know, we start with gravity. The latter, right? Is the most important. 
Yeah, this is why I don't, you know, I'm a, the, with all the terms to me, this is like the basic underlying thing, like you said, we're all after. At least to me, this is what martial arts always meant to me, this this concept, this idea. And so when we say it's health or it's fighting or it's this, to me, it's to miss the point. To me, it's this, and then you can use this in any way you want. What What is it? You can't really see it. If you're only going to understand it through training, you can do it standing, slow forms, fast. You do, you know what I mean? It's formless, really. Right. Right, 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 right. You, you, you're, I mean, you, you can understand the value of it when you practice it or how much more power it gives you, whatever. But yeah, yeah, it's not like, you know, I mean, most people, they either start a martial art, maybe traditionally want to learn a bunch of forms because, you know, they look cool, right? And they're fun to do and they're good exercise. And they're really kind of sometimes skipping over the whole, you know, most important part. And then, you know, some people just want to fight or they want self-defense. All good. But uh, I don't know about the just doing form, but if you're going to learn to really fight, you will come to this realization. You have, to, you will get it. It would beat into you every time you spar. <laughs> so that's why, uh, you know, I say, uh, I talked about this not long ago. My friend Ed Hines asked, I did a podcast with him in, in France and he asked me, he said he gets a lot of questions about people that do a lot of, you know, traditional styles and styles where they don't spar much or fight. And, you know, they kind of get a, this kind of weird scent, false sense of security. They're not really sure. Or, and, and he asked me, he said, how, how long would it, you know, take you to figure out uh, re, like the reality of how good you are, what you know. And it's like three minutes. It takes three minutes. You put gloves on and go in the ring with someone that can fight. You will know in, well, one minute, you know, whether you're delusional or not. Right. Because that feedback is immediate and real and it's violent and, uncont- and, and not cooperative and it's not controlled. So this is what, you know, like, why you'll learn more about yourself if you if you if you want to if you're trying to teach someone these these principles and they're not getting it they need to start sparring hard they'll start to understand L- literally every single person that i've known over the years like you know i teach jujitsu we do combat sports my mma fighters they all have they all at a, at a certain level of competency they all have a, a, a very high level awareness of them their environment and and what's about to happen, you know, that, that kind of relationship. Now, I mean, is it spiritual to them or, or do they always have perfect posture? No, I don't know, you know. So you you need to challenge yourself with, you can do it. You could, you could get to that level of self-awareness through just meditating and doing yogic practices and that kind of thing. But that, again, it doesn't mean you can fight. But if you're going to do it the martial way, you can save a lot of time by fighting. That's interesting you say that because... Now, if I'm if I'm if I'm approaching this idea from just fighting, am I building the wall with it? Am I sitting in a chair with it? Like, does it carry over that way? So, like in Alexander technique, we're coming at it from that. And then, if you you know, you'd have to learn to fight because you're not you know you can get out of a chair. Well, maybe, but I just had some. Well, I'll let you answer that first before I go further. No, like I just said. So, like guys who do say combat martial arts and those kind of things, do they keep it all the time, or they maybe not? Right. All right. You know, but you know, you know what they can do though, they'll have it when they really need it. Get it when so they yeah. could apply it. We could say in theory much quicker. Right now, are they doing kung fu all day like Yang Wu Chan? Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe Would it not. be better if they did. Absolutely. Right. But you gotta find it first, right? Yeah. So I think my point maybe is sometimes it's difficult, you know, to even understand what we're talking about, and, and unless you you have. And it's almost like uh, shock inoculation from it, right? And then you start to go, okay. And then you start to go, I'm tired of getting punched in the face when I spar. And then the only way not, it's not learning. And it, of course, technique and all that physicality, but none of that, none of that's going to uh, really help until you have that kind of mind body connection. And you're aware of all these things. That's my point. Now, why do samurais meditate, right? They're killing machines because it makes them even better. You're talking about now adding on to, this awareness they already have and deepening it, deep, deepening that awareness and then keeping it at all times. Right. And it helps keep them alive. Right. So obviously that's even better. So, you know, different ways to get it and different levels of having it. That's why I really, I, I, I think you just kind of answered a question for me. I sort of been struggling with for years because I get, I've gone up between these worlds for a long time. And um, I, I had somebody on not too long ago and I was like, well, how do you know if somebody is a really good Alexander practitioner? So I, I go to, you've gone to these teachers and stuff. But it's like, how do you know that they're any good? 
right? What's the litmus test? How they get out of a chair? And if I'm a new student, how do I find a, you know, there's so many Alexander teachers and there's so many different uh, interpretations of his work, like where people totally even disagree over what it is. It's like, oh, well, it's how they move. They're very fluid or, uh, you know, they're very agile or something. It's like, well, maybe they came into the technique that way. How do we know the technique delivered that? Like, you know what I mean? Like, where's the, how do we know? It's, it seems like what you're saying is more black and white, actually. Like, Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, obviously, if it's a martial art, fighting will be the test of, of a certain extent. Yeah. So, you know, I guess short of hanging your Alexander teacher some gloves and seeing if they, you know, I'm kidding. So <laughs> I, I would feel like something like the Alexander technique, though, obviously, if you look at them and they have, you know, nice alignment, they move very smoothly. I would think the acid test would be you have a lesson with them and do you do you move more smoothly after it? You know, that, because they're 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 their per- like my purpose would be to teach someone to fight in whatever venue their purpose would be to make you a better mover or you feel better in your own body. Right. So that's what I would do. If I went to a teacher and they look great and they're moving around nice. And then I, you know, I had a lesson with them and be like, do I feel like I'm moving better now? Or, you know, that will be the acid test, but you're right. It's not something that it's, it's going to be objectively hard to, to, to quantify whatever level they're at because it's not, it's not a competition. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, that, that's, that's the, even a lot of yogis, you know, like you go, wow, he's really good at yoga because he's super flexible. It's like, I know super flexible people have never heard of yoga. So, you know, there's got, there's something beyond it. But when it comes to things that can't be objectively tested like that, it's going to be harder to know. There was a funny story of there was an Alexander Technique um, conference at a hotel in Chicago. And somebody overheard these two maids talking. They're like, who are the, what is this group here in town at the conference room? And she's like, the other one said, I don't know, but I think they're all people that have some sort of neck injury. <laughs> so the, they were all trying to be very straight, right? Yeah, yeah. This yeah. idea, again, of the natural postures, like trying to be natural versus how do we find what's natural, right? Yeah. What you read, though, he uses images too, right? I mean, it's not, it's not as mechanical as, you know, it's fairly kinesthetic sense oriented, which is usually you know, you tap into your kinesthetic sense with an image, right? Same, same. And it's interesting because, you know, he had, he had I don't, I don't, I, as far as I know anyway, he didn't have any kind of connection to Eastern practices. He was in Australia, right? You know, like in the turn of the last century. So, you know, it's very impressive that he came up with these things trial and error on his own without any, any vocabulary or background from any place. So that's very impressive, but seems to be kind of image driven. It's image driven. And he was very much opposed to the anatomy and doctors of his time he was kind of like fighting with the medical community mm-hmm. and he got a lot of his ideas I, I just found this out that he was a student of del sart a french the del sart method you know with actors and actresses oh right right which was very del sart would draw the images and hand them to people and show them so yeah the image stuff is interesting and i see this through all your basic concepts and stuff it's constant image and visualizations this constant connecting with the body, with the mind. Sometimes I get Alexander teachings that seems like a little disconnected sometimes. Like he had a hard time conveying his ideas to his students, I felt. Well, it's just, you know, it's a difficult task. You know what I mean? Again, it's not just sets and reps or, you know, it's hard to quantify as well. I was just going to say, you know, if you say, you know, you're, you're, you're a coach and like a conditioning coach, if the guy can lift more weight this week than last week, it's easy to quantify, right? That's right. It's like, do you know how, do you feel better in your body? I mean, it's hard to quantify that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's going to be almost all, I mean, I guess objectively you can look at posture, you know, we can all tell who's coordinated, who's not, right? Yeah. For the most part, like you don't have to be a trained ballet dancer to know who can dance if you watch. But on the other hand, it's still got to be, do they feel better? Are they more efficient? You know, that kind of thing. That'd be hard. hard it's hard to quantify. Then we have this whole other kind of curveball, but it's interesting because we find it in the Chinese martial arts, which is animal forms, mimicking animals. We find it in yoga in Tibet, but then we find it in where Alexander's coming from. An act, he's an actor. They're portraying another human being, you know, you're like a character actor. So, you know, I talked to like Pauli Zink, where he's putting his mind as a monkey right, and right. moving, and it changes his movement and and what's natural is a monkey as human being being a monkey or is alexander playing a role or in these chinese different martial arts it's like it seems like there's also another way to approach it this way which is again mind and visualization it's another way to visualize so you know like chinese have animal forms right so it's not 
I, and it's not so much, I mean, you know, like, like, you know, like poly zinc, a monkey saw, yeah, they kind of, they act like a monkey, but I don't think that's the important part. The important part is they've studied that, that animal. So the intent makes that, it's not like I could pretend I'm a monkey, but I don't really have that intent. Right. So it should be the intent causes those kind of movement patterns or, you know, like a tiger or something, right. You obviously don't have claw. So you have this kind of like, Maybe some movement like a tiger, but it's more, or like in Xing Yichuan, the 12 animals, you don't really act like the animal. You try to imbi- like imbue the intent of the animal when it fights. Monkeys are like clever and mischievous, you know, devious kind of thing. A bear is like big and brave. And that was more the idea of it. So that, that's, the, it probably goes back to this kind of shamanistic ideas. I mean, we used to, you know, wear furs and dance like, you know, to invoke, you know, the animal spirits so we could, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, you know humans, or yeah, really like an actor. So you know, it's interesting when they when they measure things like uh, testosterone levels in men, they'll have people come in and they'll just have them slump in a chair. They don't tell them why. They'll take they'll swab their mouth. They'll they'll look at their T level and they'll just say, hey, you know, it's like an experiment. While I'm talking to you, we want you to slump over. And 50 minutes later, they'll swab their mouth. Their testosterone's gone down. They don't from their posture. They didn't they didn't tell them to act weak or feel weak. Then they have them sit up in their chair. And or they'll do it the opposite. They'll have someone come in and sit up straight. Their T goes up. So you're just you know your mind and body are always they're, they're continuums, right, of, of the same entity. So holding your structure a certain way will cause all these physiological changes. So obviously, if you're visualizing something like you're an animal or whatever, I, I suppose if you imagine you're a tiger and jump around, your testosterone would go up. You know what I mean? So. All these things are very useful. And, you know, they over trial and error, they were like, you know, those shamans who pretend like they're, uh, you know, tigers seem to be a lot stronger than the ones that pretend like they're squirrels. <laughs> you know, that's right. And you start figuring things out. Yeah. It's, it's, it was, it's a bit of a chicken and an egg, right? It's like if we work our body from a mechanical point of view, like, okay, deal with the posture, or we deal with it from the mind and that'll take care of the mechanical. Or, you know, like what you said, you're slumping in a chair. Your, your 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 mind goes first and then your body's following so it seems like here in the basic concepts we're trying to do both simultaneously it's like why just focus on one let's 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 address both of these yeah it's synergistic so you know you could i tell you what you could slump in a chair and pretend you're a tiger your team might not go up you know what i mean so it's gonna, gonna be a little of both right or maybe you break even so your your structure is going to affect your kind of internal workings mm-hmm. So, you know, people are depressed. What does the word mean? It means you're pressed down. See, depressed people with their chest up, walking around, you know, they're depressed, right? So if you're not depressed and, you, and, you, and, you're just, and you're just lazy and you're slumping all the time, you'll tend to get more depressed. And if you're not, if you are depressed or, or you know, like, like you know, when you're a kid, when, you, when you're sad and your dad or your mom goes, just force yourself to smile, you'll feel better. You do feel better because, you know, you have hormonal reactions and all that stuff and and uh you know it, it causes an effect so but the mind's going to be probably the the you know the, the mind's going to be like the the boss at the end of the day so you know your your brain is like how would you come out of a slump if you don't know you're in it you have to be aware of it and then you're back to your mind the awareness thing so that's the it, you know the mind body unity i like that. i feel like that's just the more crit- that, i feel like that's the more neglected things these days the body is mostly taken, and the mind is like most people don't even address the mind or what even is the mind. But yeah. it's even in Alexander technique and somatics, it's really still on the back burner and it's not addressed all that much. So I feel like we have a very complete Alexander technique here just in your basic concepts. I feel like we we start basically under your relaxation. I feel like Alexander didn't doesn't even really get to the next few concepts in the just that chapter. I, I feel like that was a very good point. If you're doing it for martial arts too, obviously it's physical or physical practice. So, you know, you want your mind to kind of lead your body and, you know, you're, as you have, you adopt different alignments, whatever it reinforces and it goes back and forth. But the bottom line, the intent is going to be prime. Just like in a real fight, you can be bigger, stronger, faster, and be really good at fighting. If you don't have the will to win, you won't win. You got to have the mindset in the first place, right? So, you know, that would pretty much be, and then the rest are, you know, you just use the images in, in the exercises. Is there anything else? Is there anything we left out you want to add? No, that was, I mean, we covered the, the other principles are all kind of just fall in line with what we talked about, I feel. So, you know, hopefully uh, I just, I mean, when I teach, I just try to convey that, 
you know, these, these ideas, the continuums of brute force to, you know, Jing from being too floppy to too tight, all, you know, finding that balance, understand, understanding the relationship with gravity, and then, you know, using images starting with basic mechanical level up to kind of, you know, um, make the shape and movement of your body. Th those are the pretty much the foundations, I feel, of all the, the practice. Yeah, I, I agree. I like to just, I love to just train those things. To me, there's, they're, no, they're endless. Like I, I work on these things every day. Very cool. Um, well, thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Always nice to see you. Yeah, you too, Bryson. I had a good time. Thank you.